Awesome, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Ed. Uh, really great to kick off the conference. And uh, it is a huge pleasure uh, to uh, be doing the opening keynotes for the Kubernetes AI Day. I think there's going to be a really great, really exciting lineup coming up. And this talk in particular, uh, we have a lot of content to go through, uh, but it's not just a lot of content, it's very dense content. A lot of the single slides that we're going to be covering today are from other talks that I have given, which, as you would imagine, would be one hour plus content. So what I do encourage uh, everyone uh, in this room is if you're interested in any of the areas that we're covering today, for you to actually uh, either check out uh, further resources, find out a bit more, and more importantly, a lot of the things that we're gonna be covering today are not set in stone, um, you know, uh, ultimate knowledge, it's still something that is being uh, uh, explored and it really is uh, uh, areas in the machine learning and MLOps space that need uh, more brains to, to get together and, and, and try to figure it out together. So that, that will be, as you will see, uh, a lot of the, 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 the call-outs that we will be doing throughout the presentation. So a little bit about myself. Uh, so as Ed uh, mentioned in the introduction, I am Engineering Director at Cellon Technologies. Uh, a company that focuses on machine learning deployment and monitoring. Uh, so we have one of the most popular uh, Kubernetes-based uh, deployment tools uh, for machine learning. Um, I'm Chief Scientist at the Institute for Ethical AI, a uh, research center based in the UK that focuses on developing frameworks uh, to ensure the responsible development and operation of machine learning systems. I'm also a governing council member at large at the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery. So, uh, Today what we're going to be covering is a couple of areas including uh, the, uh, surrounding the state of cloud-native production machine learning and MLOps. So we're going to be talking about motivations, so why should we care, some challenges that exist in the, in the space. We're going to delve into some trends around the industry and the domain, some things that we have actually seen uh, converge uh, in, in the different areas. We're going to talk about some technological trends um, that will be quite uh, relevant uh, from both the Kubernetes and the MLOps space. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the organizational trends. What have we seen in terms of organizations when they look into building capabilities of MLOps at scale? Uh, how do they bring in that into their organization? What are the roles that are involved into that? And what are the ratios between those roles? And finally, we're just going to give some uh, wrap-up words. So let's get started with the motivation and challenges. One thing that I don't have to repeat anymore that I think everybody here will agree is that uh, contrary to previously popular belief, the life cycle of the machine learning model does not end once it's trained. If anything, it begins once it's finally trained and put in production. Once a model is put in production, this is when value starts getting uh, uh, extracted from this machine learning model, business value that then ends up actually facing some of the real world challenges. Uh, things like data divergence, concept drift, potential uh, you know, requirements of uh, addressing uh, domain-specific uh, challenges, whether it could be you know, ethical-related challenges or potential just uh, risk-related challenges. So there are a lot of considerations that need to be put in place for not just the ability to achieve a robust productionization of machine learning, but continuous uh, uh, capabilities uh, that are automated, not for a single model, but at scale, right? With hundreds or thousands of machine learning models, each of them with even potentially advanced monitoring components. So, why is production machine learning so challenging? From a technical perspective, we have seen a lot of considerations that have come up, things like, uh, that go beyond just traditional microservices architectures, uh, the fact that some of the, the machine learning services may require specialized hardware, Right, things like GPUs, CPUs, etc., etc. There are complex data flows. Right, you, you don't only deploy a single component. You have multiple components where, if something fails or something happens, it would affect things down the stream, and it would also have considerations up the stream. So you have complex data flows that have to be not just considered, but then going into the other areas, version and. Um, you know, co co uh, encompassing reproducibility constraints, right? If something goes wrong and you want to actually verify something that happened perhaps last week or last year, you would want to be able to reproduce that exact experiment 
for diagnostic purposes, but also for auditability purposes. And finally, there are some compliance requirements when it comes to the use of machine learning. You actually have a lot of uh, um, close interaction with the domain that you uh, are acting upon. And often, the um, effects that you face when deploying and rolling out machine learning technology can be, uh, to an extent, that would be even generational, right? Uh, the impact that you could have in someone's life, if there is uh, an incorrect prediction, it could actually affect not just the individual, but it could affect that individual across generations, right? And, and, and that actually uh, leads into the second part, not just the technological challenges, but also the higher level challenges, right? Um, you know, we, we come into considerations when it comes to machine learning around things that you may have heard, such as, uh, you know, algorithmic bias, misuse of personal data, but also uh, it could be to the traditional software extent, things like software outages. What if you're actually running a service, uh, a machine learning service that powers critical infrastructure? What if that service goes down, right? What are the considerations for that? And similarly, there is the challenge of security that you face in the, in the general traditional software space, but that now has to be brought into the, the, the machine learning space. And one thing that we have to remember is that the impact of a bad solution can even be worse than no solution at all, right? So if you're, if you're curious about that, there are other resources that talk a little bit more on that, on that area. Now, there is also considerations on the, on the concept of the roles, right? We actually see some of that, like often when organizations are starting their journey into machine learning and MLOps, they tend to try to hire for these capabilities, right? And they put a job description that tries to hire this unicorn, right? Somebody with like, you know, a double PhD, 10 years of Kubernetes experience, uh, you know, domain expertise, uh, tons of experience in like software development for the salary of an intern, right? I mean, you know, where are you going to find those unicorns? We're now seeing a convergence to the realization that you not only have to get a single resource that is going to be uh, uh, capable of doing everything, but now you have a segregation of roles, which we're going to cover a little bit. And it's similar uh, into the extent that goes well beyond the technical domain. Right? It's not just about the technology, it's about the domain, it's about the use case, it's about the abstraction of, of the domain capabilities, and making sure that, similar to how we are actually seeing in some trends, you're addressing each use case in a way that is proportionate to the risk involved. Right? You're not going to have to bring in the right level of expertise if you're building a prototype for a group of five, five uh, stakeholders, versus if you're rolling out a uh, large-scale machine learning service that will affect hundreds or thousands of individuals with high risk. So, so that's some of the high-level you know, motivations and challenges. Now let's start delving into some of the trends, solutions, and things we're actually seeing in the field. So the first one that we're seeing is what we can call the consolidation of practical AI ethics. One of the realizations that we have seen is that people came into the conclusion that we can have all of the round tables we want, we can sit and agree that discrimination is bad, that doing harms to humans is bad, but if the underlying infrastructure does, is not built by design to be able to uh, 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 operation deliver those higher level principles, you're going to end up not being able to achieve those responsible AI requirements. So what we're now seeing in industry is a consolidation that, of course, principles are important to provide that more star, but it's enough to have every single tech company publishing their principles for AI ethics. And what is now required is not only those lower level considerations like industry standards, regulatory frameworks, but even what is critical is at the lower level, the software uh, uh, frameworks, platforms, you know, whether it is uh, yeah, CNCF tools, Linux Foundation tools, open source, closed source tools, those have to be built with those principles by design. And they have to actually encompass those higher level requirements in order for them to you know, be enforceable and, 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 and scalable, not just for a single sort of like use case. So that's, that's an interesting area. And, and, and we did a, an interesting uh, exploration on this that was presented at the New Europe's conference. So if you want to check it out, you can, you can have a look at uh, some, some deeper areas. And similarly, it's not just about the tools. Uh, one thing that people are realizing is that it's also about accountability structures. And we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that. But for, for, for you to kind of like grasp uh, the, the, the idea of this, is that um, high impact, large ethical challenges cannot fall into the shoulders of a single data scientist or a single DevOps practitioner. 
right? It is important to make sure that you have the right human touch points throughout the development, design, and operation of machine learning systems at scale, similar to how we have seen this trend in the general software space when introducing controls at an organizational level, level um, um, as uh, you know, through the name of the software development lifecycle, right? What are the steps that you have to carry out? And we're going to talk a little bit more about what uh, we could do to extrapolate this into a machine learning development lifecycle. But here you can see that, of course, it's important for an individual practitioner to adopt best practices, to ensure that they are using the most relevant tools, that they have competencies in the field. But one thing to remember is that uh, an ethical individual does not mean an ethical compound or an ethical uh, uh, compound. Right? A lot of the high level, uh, high profile, um, I guess, articles that you have seen in the news where uh, technology is rolled out and it has had like significant uh, negative impact, it wasn't, it wasn't like every single data scientist was thinking, oh yes, I'm going to do evil today and I'm going to build this, this uh, uh, discriminative, uh, uh, bad uh, uh, machine learning model, right? Ultimately, it is people that may, may have the right intentions, but may end up with, uh, uh, um, um, uh, you know, undesired effects. So that's where you have to go into the higher level. The team, the delivery process has to be in place in order to ensure that it's proportionate to, to the risks, and then higher even level to the departmental uh, and organizational structures that need to be in place. Of course, we would, we would go a level higher, you know, we were talking about the regulation. And one thing that has been quite interesting is that we have seen that, you know, a lot of the times you hear that regulation is playing catch up, but recently we have actually seen that tech companies are playing catch up into regulation. And we have seen some really interesting regulatory uh, 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 policy documents that have been uh, published in the European Union uh, to bring in best practices at scale at a national level. Right? And that's the definition of regulation, right? Similar to how you would have it in the organisms, is to make sure that you put things in place to avoid the entire, I don't know, market ending up consuming itself into this capitalistic short-term thinking and instead prioritize for longevity by enforcing best practice. And we have actually seen that in the proposal for the AI regulatory proposal that came out last year. It was actually really interesting how it tackled it by proposing Leveraging best practices proportionate to the risk involved. And now this year we're seeing another proposal that, that tries to achieve a similar thing, but in cybersecurity. Is how do you ensure, um, you know, the things that we're discussing in this conference, things like supply chain security, things like, uh, you know, uh, common vulnerability uh, 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 exploit addressing, but ensuring that that is actually in place at the industry level, at the, at the, at the national level. So there are some interesting things uh, to, to check out there. And the other thing to emphasize is that it, you know, it, it is not just important to, to make sure that uh, you know, these policy makers are creating these frameworks, these proposals, but the people in this room, practitioners, and even to, to a certain extent, open source, um, uh, open source committee members and, and, and contributors, they themselves have uh, a, a lot of uh, potential uh, meaningful contributions that they can bring to the table, right? Because it ultimately will be these frameworks that we're discussing, even in the Kubernetes AI day, that will be impacting society uh, for the years to come. So it is actually important uh, to ensure that we realize that now uh, there is, to a certain extent, that uh, concept of programmatic governance where the machine learning and, and, and software uh, frameworks, they will be limited by the capabilities, if they don't uh, adopt those type of principles like reproducibility, security, compliance, transparency by design, they're not going to be able to be enforced at the, at the higher level. So that's, that's something interesting uh, to consider. Now let's move to the technological trends. So, you know, just to put it into, into perspective, you know, we all remember the, the early days of machine learning, when, you know, how it started, and now this is, you know, how it's going right now, right? So we have pretty much tools coming out every single day, every single week, a brand new shiny tool for MLOps, a brand new shiny tool, shiny tool for machine learning monitoring. So there's a question as practitioners, how do we navigate this highly complex, ever-growing ecosystem? The interesting thing that we're seeing is that we're now um, observing a convergence of what we can call an architectural blueprint. 
right? Irrespective of what are the logos that, what are those little logos that you choose to bring into your organization, there is a convergence of what does MLOps look like anatomically, right? How does it look like across every organization? And this is kind of like a super, super simple way to put it. You know, there are other resources that we're going to link that cover it into more detail. This is just more from an intuition perspective. So if we have a look at, 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 at the different sort of like, you know, uh, 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 data uh, related areas, we have in this case training data, we have artifact storage, and we have inference data. This is oversimplifying it massively. However, the way that we can think about it is that the purpose uh, that we would have as the initial step would, uh, could be seen as experimentation, right? Assuming that you would be able to convert this training data into useful artifacts uh, in, in, in this context, trained models. These trained models are what you would want to actually start getting business value from, right? So you would use programmatic uh, interfaces through CICD or ETL type systems to ensure that you have the ability to continuously deliver those artifacts into a homogeneous interface, right? So whilst you have this heterogeneous set of uh, machine learning training uh, uh, frameworks that your data scientists would use for their hyperparameter tuning, training, evaluation, you would want to have a standardized environment where you have uh, the control uh, of, of, of your production capabilities. So in that case, you would have the, 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 the machine learning deployment, the machine learning serving for real time or batch capabilities, and then you would then be able to extrapolate it and add what would be that observability stack, right? Your advanced machine, uh, advanced monitoring capabilities, your outlier detection, drip detection, explainability. Now, all of the inputs and outputs that you would have for your models, you would, you would be able to call that your inference data, and it's important to, to consider that this inference data in itself differs from your training data in potentially many ways, right? It could be different formats, it could be that it's not labeled, you'll have the uh, actual labels. You would want to still be able to have a way to communicate that back into your uh, you know, data lakes or training data to start uh, to, to create that continuous uh, value generation capabilities in your machine learning stack. And we will see that there are some, some, some hard requirements when it comes to creating those things. But this is just an intuitive way to see that sort of production machine learning anatomy. Now, of course, there is a key consideration in the context of metadata, with so many of these tools lying across every single phase of the machine learning lifecycle, there is a need for you to be able to ask, what do I have out there, right? What are my digital assets that are adding risk within my organization and that are also potentially adding value within my organization? How do I discover those things? How do I search across those things, especially with the heterogeneity in, in, that, in that infrastructure? But, but yeah, the key thing here is that there are some architectural blueprints that are coming out and organizations are looking to create those uh, uh, you know, so that they can define uh, uh, from a perspective of I don't care what logos you put here as long as we have those controls, as long as we have those mechanisms, as long as we have these this requirements. And, you know, similarly, uh, there has been a conversation around converging into a canonical stack, right? Like best in class, best in breed, as opposed to end to end single platform. But, but then there's the question of, well, is there, there going to be a single canonical stack that we can all agree consists of X machine learning serving framework, Y experimentation framework, Z uh, uh, model artifact framework? What we're seeing is that it's not just a single canonical stack is that it's a set of canonical stacks. And there is this really interesting tool called MyMLOps where you can actually pick and choose uh, for each of these stages depending on what your needs are. And this is kind of like what we're seeing towards is instead of just convergence into a single canonical stack, you have a potential set of like pick and choose based on what your requirements are. But we are still seeing uh, a set of a subset of tools that are becoming more popular uh, than others uh, uh, for, for particular areas. We are seeing maturing in, in machine learning monitoring, right? So we talked a little bit about the concept of monitoring. In the cloud native space, we are used to operational monitoring, right? Monitoring of uh, services, right? What is my latency? What, is, what are my requests per second? What is my number of, of, of 500 errors? What is my, my, my number of, you know, operational metrics? We are now seeing this extrapolate into, into the machine learning space into what we can call machine learning specific metrics. So this is, you know, of course, things like performance that you see in microservices. But you can also see machine learning performance, right? It's like, what is my accuracy? What is my precision? What is my recall? What is my RMSE? So machine learning specific metrics that you would want to abstract 
at scale, right? You don't want to have that sort of like, uh, I mean, if you, if you have heard in the DevOps space, this, 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 this uh, pet versus cattle uh, uh, concept where you don't want to have each machine learning model have their specialized way in, in which how you monitor that specific one. You would want to have a standardized way in how you capture those metrics and display them into the relevant domain experts. Similarly, introducing um, drift detection and outlier detection at scale. And the consideration here is that drift and outlier detection um, um, uh, tools are also machine learning models, right? So whilst you are introducing a way to reduce risk when you add an outlier detector, you're also introducing risk, right? Because you're putting another machine learning model there. Are you going to add an outlier detector for your outlier detector? Right? Is, that, is the question that you have to consider of what is the risk that I'm having there? And then finally, explainability, not just as a set of techniques, but as, a, as an infrastructural component, right? Is how do you then roll out explainability as a architectural paradigm, right? So those are some considerations to, to take into account. And then actually also going into the next piece about, um, you know, observability by design, right? Is now that you have this uh, mach uh, machine learning monitoring components, how do you then move from dashboards into actionable insights that are happening without you having to go and look at a dashboard. And this is kind of like, you know, bringing the best uh, practices from observability in the microservices space into the MLOps space. So, you know, things like alerting, things like introducing machine learning specific SLOs, like uh, service level uh, uh, objectives or SLIs, what are my indicators? Uh, you know, bringing in concepts like progressive rollouts is, do I want to actually deploy this model as a shadow or a canary? And I want to automatically roll it out if it achieves this SLO, right? And then finally, being able to like drill down on the metrics that you're collecting, uh, that it's not just noise, that is actually meaningful uh, things that your data scientists and data analysts can consume. We're also seeing a trend where we're moving away from model-centric concepts into data-centric, right? Instead of us actually thinking, how do I deploy this machine learning model? We're now moving into the concept of how do I deploy this machine learning system? And this is to the, to the, to the data flows consideration that we talked uh, a bit before, is that we're no longer seeing a machine learning model as an isolated component, right? We're seeing this as a, as, as a network where if something goes wrong, it may affect things up the stream and down the stream. So it's important to consider. In this case, you, ha you can see this example being, uh, you know, how uh, Facebook introduces, uh, uh, how, how they, how they um, uh, architecturally uh, define their, 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 their search. And you can see here that there are multiple components with multiple machine learning uh, artifacts and then different data flows across each area. So you have like the indexing where, you, where they create uh, their, 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 their indexes from their documents and then how they process the queries in terms of retrieval and ranking to produce a result. There is a you know, extremely non-trivial interaction that you have across machine learning components. And if you don't have that, uh, you know, things that we discussed around observability, monitoring, you know, outlier detection, drift detection, embedded as an infrastructural concept, you're going to really struggle because you're going to be building each of these things as an individual pet, right? As, uh, you know, going back to the pet versus cattle uh, uh, analogy uh, that, that has to be considered. So, so yeah, moving from model-centric to data-centric and considering what are the data flows and the interfaces and the schemas that you're, that you're interacting with at each of the different areas. And then we're also seeing the, the intersection of, I mean, you, 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 have, you may have heard the concept of data meshes. So data meshes is more popular in the, I guess, data uh, world. Uh, I guess we're probably in like Spark conferences uh, um, where you're seeing this concept of data mesh, which proposes the ability to, to move away from that sort of like central data leak, central data platform, central data team, and instead move into a domain uh, specific set of squads, right? Is how do you then are able to provide these platform capabilities at a domain level, right? Empower your data analysts, make sure that you have, um, you know, squads of data engineers with machine learning engineers, with MLOps engineers that are acting on that sort of like domain vertical specific area as opposed to just centralized uh, uh, capabilities. So th there's an, an interesting, I guess, collaboration that is happening between MLOps and then data ops slash data mesh uh, perspectives. Then we talked a little bit about metadata, right? So metadata is important because, of course, we already have some really interesting solutions that have come out from the general databases side, right? When it comes to data lakes, you always have to ask the question of what are the tables that I have out there? 
What are the, the, the schemas of the tables that I have out there? How do I, how do I know and, and search and discover all of the, all of the tables that I, that I can query, right, for my data analysts to consume? And how do I keep track of all of the different views of tables that I create? We are now seeing the same questions at the machine learning sort of uh, space where you're asking the question, okay, well, so I've trained a machine learning artifact and I deploy this artifact. Now I have a one-to-many relationship, right? Because I can actually instantiate a, a, an artifact multiple times across multiple environments. So what are those models that I have running? How do I discover what I can consume? How do I know what value I can get from each of these models that I have? And then now going beyond the machine learning model metadata, you're also asking the questions of what are the interfaces, the inputs and outputs of that machine learning model? How do I know what do I have to do to consume that model? So now you're moving into the concept of data metadata. And the, the reason why, you know, and maybe this is starting to be a bit confusing, but the reason why data metadata is important is because of that sort of link that we were talking about from inference data to training data. How do you then convert the data that you're capturing in your inference side, in your production side, and then bring it into your training uh, data lake, right? You have to have an understanding of what's the schema What's the shape of that data so you can convert it and then use it and process it? So you can see here, you know, it's quite interesting because you're asking the question of, well, how do you go from inference data back to what, you know, you, you see in, in, in the early starts of the machine learning lifecycle? Data labeling, right? Can you bring some inference data back all the way to your data labeling so that, like, the annot annotation practitioners are able to go and relabel that data, that new data, and train new models? So it's interesting to see like how the metadata interoperability considerations are now extending, not just into the deployment side, but also they're becoming completely end-to-end. -end. So then going now back into uh, the end-to-end, -end, uh, uh, you know, I guess, life cycle of the machine learning model, one thing that we're also seeing is being considered is the question of security, right? What are the potential vulnerabilities that I can find throughout the end-to-end -end life cycle of machine learning model? And when you actually look at this traditional sort of like, you know, machine learning model lifecycle where you have like the data training, the, the, the model building, and then the deployment and monitoring, you can ask the question, well, what, what are the different areas in the ML lifecycle where you can find security vulnerabilities? And the interesting thing is that that would be on all of the red areas, which means that every single part of your machine learning model lifecycle has potential security vulnerabilities. So security has now become quite a key area, uh, quite a key area of research in the MLOP space, because now we need to ask the question, how do we achieve safe uh, uh, and cyber, like, uh, cyber secure machine learning systems that will be enforcing controls at every stage of the machine learning lifecycle? And actually, there's uh, going to be a talk later today that is going to be talking about some of the security vulnerabilities. As you know, machine learning practitioners, we all know we love pickles. Um, so, you know, we need to guard ourselves into the potential risks that are involved in, 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 in that. So that's some of the technological trends. Um, you know, that was a, very much a whistle-stop tour. Now let's talk a little bit about the organizational trends, asking questions of what are we seeing at the team level, right? So now that organizations are, are really kind of like building machine learning platforms, building ML engineering platform teams, what does that look like? What are the trends that we're seeing uh, from organizations at, at that perspective. So the first one, we talked about that briefly. We started to see a, a trend where organizations started to define what is analogous to an SDLC, like a software development life cycle. What is the step-by-step -step process that should be carried out within our organization to make sure that we are following best practice in our software development, right? And in, in that context, that would be things like CICD, right? Like Things that now we do in our sleep, right? Git, using version control, right? In the software development space, this is a, a no-brainer. There has been attempts to try to just bring the, the, the software development lifecycle frameworks and just adapt it into the machine learning space. But what people have realized is that that just does, doesn't work. And what organizations have been doing, they have been creating from scratch a new sort of like set of uh, control mechanisms through what is now machine learning development life cycle. So this is actually a really interesting paper that shows the different stages and the different roles, personas that are involved throughout each stage of the ML life cycle, the ML platform. So this is actually something that we have, we have seen organizations starting to define, especially now you have organizations that have, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of developers 
and, and data analysts that need to actually follow these best practices to ensure compliance at scale. We also ha started to see an important shift in, in mindset. Um, traditionally, when it comes to machine learning data science projects, they, 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 they historically have been very project driven, right? I have a question, find the answer. What is going to be the X revenue or, or the Y uh, uh, click through rate about this area? Let's find the answer from data. So very project specific. The challenge with this is that organizations have seen that by delivering projects, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, 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 uh, like repeatability of, of the same sort of like, like capabilities. So now we're starting to see that mindset shifting from project to product. So treating machine learning uh, uh, capabilities as, as data products. And by data products, what you can think about this is not just trying to see the perspective of, well, should I, if I am trying to, to, to develop this uh, uh, classification model to uh, predict uh, uh, another risk for an insurance company, is the product the app that the users would leverage? The answer is no, that's not a data product. The data product is what you develop for your data science stakeholders, right? The tools, the platforms, the decisions where you say, hey, let's roll out Airflow and let's actually build an interface for Airflow. Let's roll out this metadata management system with discoverability and search capabilities so that teams can actually see what uh, other teams have done in the past and build upon it, right? Tre treating this as products, treating this as a consultative approach to product development. And that then leads us to how this looks like from a, from a, from a, from a I guess, organizational vision and, and strategy perspective. You still have to have those short-term business project value delivery capabilities where you're just delivering value, answering questions with data, bringing, bringing those kind of like deliveries from that perspective. However, you then now have to make sure that you have different uh, uh, cadence of roadmaps where you have iterative tooling development with perhaps a machine learning engineering team that is developing pipelines, that is developing tools. You then may have a, um, you know, MLOps team that is actually developing uh, tools and products and then perhaps even platforms that are powering the, the entire capabilities of the organization as what we see as that canonical MLOP stack, right? It's how should every individual within the organization, uh, uh, um, you know, work across their ML life cycle. You know, they, they spin up a Jupyter notebook and then suddenly they actually get a Kubernetes namespace and then they get like a, a, a repo where they can actually, you know, interact and deploy there. So this is actually something that we're seeing to make sure that it's not just somebody going and, and delivering the exact same thing multiple times. And then this also requires bringing some of those best practices that we started to see in the software space. You know, as many of you may have heard of the Spotify squad model, right? So this squad model is this cross-functional capabilities that you have for product development, for project delivery. This is also a methodology that can be brought in the, in the data and machine learning space, right? The ability to have that cross-functional uh, 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 squads with, with, with the concept of what you know, they refer as tribes and guilds, but at an, uh, at an organizational level, right? So how do you make sure that you adopt these capabilities and you have a product approach into your data and into your machine learning and into your infrastructure. So that's actually quite key. And now just to kind of like, uh, you know, go into the, into the final few things. Uh, now let's talk about what are those team members? What, what, what are the, the team members that are involved into that? And more specifically, what, what do we see being those uh, organizational ratios? So one thing that we are started to see, and again, this is still a discourse that is being explored, is we see, you know, uh, in a simplified view, uh, the roles of the MLOps engineer, the ML engineer, the data scientist, the data analyst, and then other roles like backend engineers, data engineers, which, you know, we don't cover here. But, but just to think about it, the way that, that we started to see some, some of these ratios is that you would tend to have one MLOps engineer that manages parts of the platform uh, that contains what we can refer to as multiple use cases or multiple use case pipelines, right? One machine learning engineer would be able to build multiple of these programmatic uh, 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 you know, use case pipelines. Whatever you want to think about this, this could be ETL, CICD, et cetera, et cetera. But these are machine learning engineers that are building kind of like continuous delivery of machine learning capabilities. Each of these use case pipelines would have a many-to-many -many relationship to a group of data scientists, right? So a group of data scientists may be actually producing models for one use case, producing models for another use case. One of these use case pipelines may be just like a one-off, 
one of those use case pipelines may be actually a programmatic continuous delivery uh, capability of a, of a machine learning model that gets retrained every month or something like that, right? So this is something that we're, we're starting to see. And then the, the concept of these data products that could also programmatically interact with those use case pipelines, right? Perhaps you have something that is automated whenever there's, there's drift detected, a new retraining capability gets, gets, gets pushed. And then of course, building those abstractions so that data analysts or domain experts can bring their domain expertise without having to become Kubernetes experts, right? Making sure that you are able to segregate the domain knowledge so that not everybody has to deal with Kubernetes manifests. So this is actually an interesting thing that we've seen with, with organizational ratios. And then another thing to consider is that this actually talks about scale, right? This assumes that you have like maybe dozens or hundreds of machine learning models with like a pretty robust capability for continuous delivery of, of data analysis at the organization, right? Like you're doing data-driven decision-making at the organizational scale, and you have a pretty large team for machine learning platform and machine learning engineering. But you don't have to start with that, right? Like you, you don't have to start with the full might of Kubernetes when you just have one machine learning model, right? So when you have a few set of models, what we tend to see is that just having data scientists, and in some cases, these are unicorn-ish data scientists, that actually have the full life cycle of their machine learning model um, in their responsibility, right? This would be people that perhaps would be using AWS HMaker or perhaps that are using fast API to wrap their own machine learning models and serve them. Now, in that case, in that case, you, what you would have is a consideration of having these data scientists managing the full life cycle. That can be managed because they are able to do that given that the number of models are very small. And this goes back into that pe uh, pet versus cattle methodology where having a single model is something that they can look after, right? They can say, okay, well, this machine learning model is something that I know how to monitor, I know how to manage. Once there's actually a larger number of machine learning models, that's when the data scientists start being distracted by doing DevOps, right? They are starting to build CI CD pipelines. They're starting to actually manage the operational metrics. They're starting to be cold in the middle of the night because something crashed. And that is when you start seeing this introduction of the role of a machine learning engineer. This machine learning engineer, which is focused on building those repeatable uh, use case pipelines, this managing the initial set of like, you know, infrastructure that may not be as large of, as, a, as an end-to-end -end platform, but it's still uh, segregating the roles and responsibilities. And then of course, once you start having production um, environments, production platforms that require SLAs to be managed, in those contexts, that's when you start bringing those DevOps engineers or MLOps engineers that are specialized in the maintenance of that platform. So yeah, so those were some of the organizational trends uh, that, that, that we're seeing. You know, again, this is something that is more of a discourse to explore. And just to, to, to give some closing uh, remarks on the wrap up, uh, we do have to remember that not everything can be solved with AI, right? When you're running around with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So we have to remember as, as machine learning practitioners that not everything is solved with AI. Sometimes you just need people. Sometimes you just need processes uh, to be able to, to, to address those, those things. And of course, you know, it's important to have that sort of call for further discourse as these are things that are still being explored. And this is important that we continue exploring these topics because we have to remember that you know, critical infrastructure increasingly depends on machine learning systems. And regardless of how many layers of software, layers of abstraction, the impact will always be human. And we have a responsibility to ensure that these are following best practices, that are following uh, those, those, those high level principles that, that we discussed initially. So with that, I want to thank everybody uh, uh, for, uh, you know, I guess, uh, keeping uh, uh, awake uh, throughout the, the, the full presentation. Uh, you can find the slides uh, on the corner, uh, so bit.ly state MLOps, and I hope everybody enjoys uh, the rest of the conference. So with that, thank you very much.